Thank you for joining us today, and please join me in welcoming our speaker, Peter McMahon. Well, thanks for, uh, for coming. Um, we could lower the light on me if, if you could. Um, thanks for the MFA for having me again. Um, so I'm going to be doing kind of an, an overview of uh, architecture on the Cape from prehistory from the glaciers to about 1972, July 1972. Uh, that's when it all just died. Um, so, uh, and, and yes, my, the book, uh, my book, Cape Cod Modern, is in the bookstore, and I'll, I'll, I can do some signings um, any afterwards if anybody would like, is interested. So the Cape um, was, was created by the last uh, of the great glaciers, um, <clears throat> and it basically acted as a snow plow, pushing in front of it sand and boulders, and this was the furthest extent of the, of the glacier. And then basically it was a giant chunk of ice which melted and the outwash from the glacier created a lot of the um, ge geology of the Cape and Islands. <clears throat> I live in Wellfleet and uh, right here and basically from Chatham up, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but there's no topsoil. Um, so farming's very difficult because the topsoil all ended up on the vineyard and uh, in the mid-cape. So why the vineyard has all of these organic farms because they actually have dirt there. Um, so the glaciers receded and left uh, this basic, uh, basically a sandbar. And it's been changing ever since. So um, wind and wave action has been slowly narrowing the cape and extending the two ends. So um, Provincetown and um, Chatham, the uh, Monomoy Peninsula in Chatham have been both been getting longer. And we lose sometimes seven feet of depth um, in Wellfleet per year, depending on the year. So uh, <clears throat> the Wampanoag. Um, have been on the on the Cape for thousands of years, and uh, basically their their dwelling was called a, a witu, which is uh, a building made out of uh, bent saplings. This is one that was built in uh, Harvard Yard recreation. So bent saplings that are lashed together with either bark or uh, mats made out of reeds um, on the inside and outside. So this, the reed matting did serve as an insulation, and then there was a smoke hole in the middle, and then mats around the edge uh, raised um, platforms for sleeping on. And apparently these were very warm and comfortable and actually uh, more cozy than the uh, first structures that the Europeans built. So the idea with these buildings is that you could put up the frame um, and then take the cladding off and move it to another structure. So the, uh, the Wampanoags like to live down near the marshes and rivers and the, the estuaries in the summer where fishing and shell fishing was good, and then back into the woods um, in the winter, which was more protected. <clears throat> so this brings up a couple of the persistent themes on, of Cape architecture. One is the reusing of parts and repurposing of, of pieces of buildings, and also this idea of flexibility and mobility, um, that buildings can be moved, um, recombined, and um, reconfigured. So this is sort of a single family. Uh, we too, the, uh, they would combine them into longhouses for multiple family dwellings. Uh, these were popular all around the Northeast. Uh, when, the, when settlers, when European settlers got to the Cape, <clears throat> there was um, basically a climax hardwood forest there. So this is chestnut, oak, giant um, uh, canopy of, of climax hardwood. Um, the native people had no way of cutting these down 
uh, they didn't have the technology. So they would um, basically build their settlements in clearings and they would burn the understory once a year so that they could get around for hunting. So this probably looks something like the redwood forest in um, Northern California where you have just a clear open understory. Um, the, um, there's also, you can see where the Wampanoags um, settled by what are called midden piles, which are these giant piles of oyster shells um, where for over hundreds of years they were in the same spot uh, eating oysters and um, so you can often find arrowheads and other artifacts around where you find the midden piles. So the Europeans, um, we found this photograph which was, seems to be some kind of transitional building between the European and the Ritu, uh, where they've incorporated uh, European doors and uh, fireplaces. The early um, Cape houses, which is the sort of iconic Cape Cod house, <clears throat> um, is in some ways related uh, these are post and beam structures, so there are uh, like, a, like a barn, post and beam um, members with a layer of planks on the outside, um, like a barn basically. And then to create insulation, they would build up the interior of the wall, some, often with plaster, seaweed, paper, whatever was available. Um, to create some kind of um, thermal value. This is the Lorenzo Dow Baker House in Wellfleet. Um, and you can see that this, this photo was taken in the late 30s. You can see there are no trees left. Um, and Wellfleet, really until the early 60s, um, there were almost no trees. So you could stand on a tall spot and see the ocean, the bay, and sometimes three or four ponds. So you can see this is very different than what the Cape looks like today. So the scrub oak and the scrub pine that you see um, is really a very recent phenomenon. So the, these, the trees were, um, when, the, when the English got there, the trees were cut down for shipbuilding, for uh, house building, and for firewood because each family needed an enormous amount of firewood per year to, um, to heat and cook. Um, this house is on Boundbrook Island, which is on the bay side. And this, is, this house is very interesting. It was lived in by a whole succession of, of interesting people. Lorenzo Dow Baker was the banana king of Wellfleet. He was a ship captain that figured out how to um, ship green bananas from Jamaica and get them to the U.S. and, and they would still be, uh, to when, when they are ripe, and became a millionaire. Uh, he had a big operation in Jamaica and at the other end of it was Wellfleet. So this is the house where he was born. Uh, this was built around 1730. Um, also this house here, this little building, <coughs> was a um, was originally out in Billingsgate Island, which is, if you on the bay side, if you go out that long peninsula, there was a little island there, which was one of the original settlements of Wellfleet. It was a, a fishing village, and um, this was a um, a little building for rendering whale fat. So this is one of the oldest buildings in Wellfleet. This is another thing. So this was when Billingsgate um, became untenable, it was all of the buildings were moved uh, to various other places in Wellfleet. In fact, Wellfleet used to be three small towns and um, all those houses were moved to where the center of the town is now because the old harbor, this um, right near here on Bar Billingsgate Island is where the old harbor was, but it silted up and they had to move the harbor to where it is now. So there's this um, sort of theme of buildings being taken apart and moved. And these buildings were often what they would call flaked, which means that they would be taken into pieces and numbered and put on a raft or a, or a sled in the winter and dragged to their new location and reassembled. So um, this house sat empty for many years um, after the Bakers left, when, when Boundbrook Island was kind of abandoned as a town, 
<clears throat> um, it sat empty for many years, and then it was bought by uh, John Dos Passos' wife. John Dos Passos, the author, lived in Provincetown, and his wife bought the house. They never actually moved in, um, and then she sold it to Jack Hall, who we're going to talk about, who is one of the modern architects. He turned it into a working farm, and then he sold it to the Biddle family, which was uh, Francis Biddle, who was the attorney general under FDR. So another um, common phenomenon in the, um, in the early days was shipwrecks. Before the Cape Cod Canal was built, all of the shipping traffic had to go around the Cape, and the shallow waters around the outer Cape were, were very uh, treacherous, and there were hundreds of shipwrecks um, that occurred on that, uh, out on, the, on what they call the backside. So there were um, maritime laws about salvage to, that had to do with who owned shipwrecks. So basically the town where the ship you know, wrecked the town after a certain amount of time or once it was uh, condemned, the townspeople would run out and start taking the boat apart. This was partly because the wood was so valuable since the, the Cape had been so deforested and a lot of these old ship timbers end up in um, houses in Wellfleet. There's also an account of somebody taking one of the masts from these ships and making hundreds of shingles out of it. Um, so this was kind of an industry in Wellfleet um, shipwrecks. Interesting also that the whaling industry started with whales washing up and then um, there, there was also some accounts of like the people in East Ham going over and getting a Wellfleet whale and pushing it back out in the water and moving it over to East Ham. Uh, so they could, um, they would cut up the whale and, and render, the, uh, render the oil. And then this progressed to them going out in the bay to catch whales and then farther and farther until they t it turned into three year journeys um, traveling around the world to get the, uh, the whales. Um, also, there is a theme on the Cape of repurposing, um, repurposing buildings for other purposes, cultural purposes. So this is an old fish wharf in Provincetown, which was turned into the um, Provincetown Players Theater that Eugene O'Neill's first plays were performed in. So um, Eugene O'Neill's first play was performed here. Um, it's a very rough building with big cracks in the floor and the, the waves would slosh up and spray the audience. Um, they would sit on, on planks across barrels and people were holding uh, kerosene lamps. So this was um, the beginning of experimental theater in, in Provincetown. And partly for economic reasons and just a sort of um, New England thriftiness, there was this sort of ad hoc reuse of structures that were available. Also, the Cape, um, the Cape had a very boom-bust economy. So there was, uh, the whaling was, was massive, and then with the advent of kerosene, the whaling uh, industry plummeted, and then the cod fishery has, has had peaks and valleys. So the Cape has always had big fluctuations in wealth and also in population. So Wellfleet census um, says that Wellfleet got all the way down to 300 people at one point um, in the 1930s. So there was a lot of abandoned buildings which became very uh, appealing to uh, some of the artists and writers who ended up there. This is a house in Provincetown being moved from Long Point, uh, floated. So this was another uh, common event. Um, so in the late 1930s, uh, as I say, Wellfleet was, was very depopulated. This is the height of the Depression. And um, there was a great deal of unoccupied land. This is the, the back side or the ocean side. And if any of you know Wellfleet, this is um, Horse Leach Pond, which is at the end of Black Pond Road, uh, which is near Newcomb Hollow Beach just north of Newcomb Hollow. And you can see there's not many trees and they're low and scrubby. And um, basically <clears throat> a very interesting 
um, man, dentist, um, and inventor from Boston um, named Dr. Rollins came to Wellfleet in the late 1800s and started buying land um, from the heirs of Lorenzo Dow Baker and also just abandoned woodlot. Um, with the, also with the advent of kerosene, people didn't want this sort of mosquito-infested land uh, that they used to use for woodlots for their houses. So um, Dr. Rollins acquired about 800 acres, um, including four or five ponds, and he gave it to his great nephew, um, Jack Phillips, here on the left, looking like kind of like Gary Cooper or something. Um, Jack Phillip, this is, the Phillips family was, um, his great-great-grandfather was the first mayor of Boston. This is Phillips, Exeter, and a uh, very old New England family. Um, he inherited this 800 acres and started living there year-round. Jack Phillips had been, um, had, had been to Paris and studied painting with uh, Leger and Layotte, and um, so he had seen early um, European modern architecture. This, um, this is his third wife, by the way, Magouche, um, who is a very interesting woman. She just died recently in Paris, but she was married to Gorky, the painter, um, before she married Jack Phillips. Um, this is a side, little side note, is that Gorky, Max Ernst, Mata, and Peggy Guggenheim all came to Wellfleet in around 1943 um, and spent, Mata and Gorky spent the winter there, or at least one winter, <clears throat> and Max Ernst was arrested by the police because they thought he was a German spy. Um, so Jack Phillips started um, occupying this land. It was sort of wilderness at that point, and um, kind of uh, building some, started to build some kind of provisional uh, structures. Now he was not trained uh, as an architect, and he, he did go to Harvard later on for a year and study with Gropius, but at this point he was really just kind of um, a dilettante. Um, he, was a, he was an artist, and this is a theme with these original people that came to Wellfleet at this in the late 30s, so we call the, the Brahmin Bohemians in the book. Um, they were all kind of from old New England families, but they were not um, going to law school, let's say that. They were, um, they were Bohemians, they were, um, they were interested in farming and making art and building things, um, and uh, very into, the, into nature. So this is the first building that Jack Phillips built. It's a painting studio. Um, and you can see it's kind of made out of salvaged parts. There's old window sashes. Um, this is a north-facing um, painting studio. You can see somebody was living in there, too. This was used um, later on by Javier Gonzalez, the painter. And um, it was a place where they would have parties, um, apparently, back in the day. So you can see it's right on the edge of the dune, <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and this building actually um, fell in the sea um, in the early 70s. <clears throat> so Jack Phillips um, you know, had these little spots on this 800 acres where he thought would be good spots for a, um, for a house. And just after the war, he bought a trainload of old army barracks. Um, which were flat-packed uh, prefab army barracks. And he put them up um, on the land and started renting them. These were summer cottages. He sold all of these eventually, and this one was bought by Arthur Schlesinger, the historian and uh, cabinet member, JFK cabinet member. Um, his parents still, I mean, his, his offspring still own this house. And this is two of those army barracks put together. And this house looks exactly the same. There's been absolutely no change made to this. So there is a kind of reverse snobbery in Wellfleet where the more important you are, the more of a shack you live in. <laughs> but um, you know, these guys were very into the Thorovian idea of a cabin in the woods with an unmediated relationship with nature. This, from where this picture is taken, you're standing right at the edge of Slough Pond, so you can literally walk out the door and jump in the pond. And, and there's this um, extreme minimalism 
which um, is, I, you know, kind of interfaced easily with the, um, the old Yankees who were living there who were doing it out of necessity. <clears throat> um, if you know uh, Charles Jenks, who's this very famous architectural historian, um, the proponent of postmodernism, this is him as a teenager sitting in front of that, that house. <clears throat> um, he grew up in, in Wellfleet and uh, one of the famous architects that just happened to end up in Wellfleet. And this is his house, which is made out of three of those army barracks, um, which he added all this sort of lattice work to. Um, and this is the view. So this house has actually been moved twice um, due to erosion. And you can, if you look out on the beach, you can see the old well pipe sticking out in the surf. Um, so this has probably been moved 60 feet or so back from its original location. So you have this continuing theme of transience that the, the sand and the sea are constantly moving everything around and the buildings have to adapt. Um, if you've seen, if you've been out to Provincetown and seen where the dune shacks are, the province lands, those are this vast area of dunes that were deforested in the 1800s and no vegetation ever grew back. So those just became um, shifting sand. And every year they have to shovel the sand off the road, off Route 6, because it, it piles up on the, on the road. So um, impermanence and flexibility. Um, Charles Jenks, um, was, was, an, was an adamant anti-modernist, and he wrote, wrote all these books decrying modernism and how evil it was, and, and, and a proponent of this sort of neoclassical postmodernism. Um, I'm not prejudiced, you can tell. Um, but this is his Garagia Rotunda, which is a prefabricated garage, uh, one-car garage, which he added all of this historical um, decoration to. You see you have the sort of gargoyle and this is a baldacchino and there's a little he reference here to the Villa Rotunda by Palladio where there's a, an oculus and um, you know it's painted 12 different shades of blue and um, anyway it's, it's, it's his kind of uh, calling card for, for uh, you know what he was, was proposing. Um, the interesting thing about this is that it continues the theme of a sort of, uh, that we'll see later, of a, of a kind of lofty architectural idea stuck on to the cheapest, most generic um, structure that you can imagine. Um, there was a, just a show at the Victoria and Albert uh, Museum in London about postmodernism, and they recreated a part of this shack in the gallery. Just, so um, getting back to the uh, Biddle farm, the um, Lorenzo Dow Baker farm. So Jack Hall was one of these Brahmin Bohemians uh, who came to Wellfleet in the late 30s. He bought 150 acres and that farm for, um, I think it was $1,500. So this is a good chunk of Boundbrook Island. Um, and he bought, you know, he inhabited this old farmhouse and then he started collecting old barns from around um, in Truro and reconstructing them on the property and creating kind of a little um, New England compound. Um, this is a barn that he got in Truro that he was reassembling. This is his antique Rolls Royce that he um, would uh, keep in there. And Jack Hall had this also, not trained as an architect, um, but very interested in building things. These guys were really doing their own thing. Um, there, there was no need for building permits in those days. Uh, it was considered impolite to actually come and see what you're doing from the part of the building factor. And, um, and also in complete obscurity, there, none of these things were being um, you know, commented on in the architectural press. So they were really doing their own thing, and all of these guys were very interested in the antique, um, and, you know, genuine antique buildings and furniture. 
but they also really liked modernism. So they would often combine them. And this was the second house he lived in, which is another house from the, 19, from the 1730s, where he would just sort of blast giant windows or um, you know, add, um, take out big pieces of the wall. It's not, it's not a uh, sort of preservationist point of view. It's really just a kind of hybridization. <clears throat> so Jack Hall's great, um, I guess his magnum opus is the Hatch Cottage. Um, he did go to New York after a while and worked for an architect um, and learned to uh, learn drafting. And uh, he worked for a year for George Nelson, the great furniture designer and architect, um, and went to Moscow. I'll show you that in a minute, and worked on this American exposition in, in Moscow. So the Hatch Cottage um, was uh, commissioned in 1960 by Robert Hatch, who was the editor of The Nation magazine, and his wife Ruth, who was a painter. And um, Jack Hall sold them the land and designed this house. This is it, the house under construction. That's this very um, uncompromising and theoretical building that is a basically a superstructure. Um, this is all made out of um, fur framing lumber with these panels that are inset to create walls and ceilings. Now this is based on um, the Jungle Gym. This is a model of the Jungle Gym, which, which he helped construct at this show in Moscow um, when he was working with George Nelson. This was a giant sort of scaffolding structure that was um, made to display um, American product to the, to the Russians. This was the first um, exposition of American products in Russia. Um, in this American exposition, there was also a dome by Buckminster Fuller and uh, the first multi-camera um, sort of slideshow by Charles and Ray Eames. So if you'll notice um, this, if you just take like this part, it's almost exactly the Hatch Cottage, um, but it's, it's, it's at a different scale and slightly different materials, but the idea is that there's a sort of... Uh, superstructure that can grow um, as needed and be filled in or open as needed. So it's a sort of a flexible framework, like a scaffolding. Um, this is a very old idea, of course, um, with American modernism. With Frank Lloyd Wright's plans, you'll see there are, there are grids, but they are flexible grids, sometimes they're they're uh, triangles or they're octagons or they're different shapes, but they grow kind of like organically, as Wright would say, they, they grow organically as you need it. Now this is an idea that was very deep in the DNA of modernism, which is um, that buildings should be responsive and flexible. And this is one of the overlaps with the, how, why the modernists are kind of keyed into the vernacular cape. There's this idea of sort of ad hoc flexible um, structures. Uh, George Nelson also designed a prefab house concept, which never got built, but this is a model of it, which was uh, aluminum factory-made cubes, which um, were on these sort of jacks that could be raised and lowered with walkways um, connecting them and big plexiglass domes on top. Um, Jack Hall obviously was influenced by this as well because the, the hatch cottage is basically seven by seven foot cubes arranged, um, arranged so that you basically you need to walk outdoors to get to the bedrooms. So there's, they are like little separate buildings. Uh, this is the interior of the hatch cottage. Um, so what you're looking at there is the back side of the siding. So there's no studs, there's no wall cavity, there's obviously no insulation. These are, this is a summer house, but it's uh, basically the structure's on the outside, so you don't really need the, um, you don't really need studs on the inside. So there's this thin skin, very thin skin, this is, this is three quarter inch uh, fur tongue and groove siding, which is basically the wall in its entirety. Um, just nailed at the top and the bottom. So this is really um, 
taking the idea of a, th of a skin to, to, a, to an extreme. Um, there's the plan of the, uh, the final plan. He did, he did envision this as a prefab uh, modular building that could be, and I, I, we have his drawings showing this arranged in all different ways, and he did try to sell it as a prefab um, product house, although he, this is the only one, so it ended up to be a prototype. But basically, he tried to sell it as a thing that you could arrange into a courtyard, donut, you know, um, a U, and et cetera. And then there are shutters which open and close. And actually, I found this building years and years and years ago before I started this whole project in the winter when it was closed up, and I really couldn't tell what it was. I thought maybe it was a storage place for lobster pots or something because there's no sign of any windows. It's just these sort of uh, weathered, weather-beaten cubes. But when you open it up, it creates these covered verandas. It's actually an amazingly um, cleverly designed building for the site. It's situated kind of perfectly to catch breezes and be shaded, and um, it's built in the lee of a, of a hill behind it so that the really strong um, winter winds blow over the top of it. So um, I started the Cape Cod Modern House Trust um, in 2007 um, after curating a show at the Provincetown Art Museum about uh, the modern architecture on the Cape. I grew up in a modern house in Wellfleet as a kid, and so I was always interested in them. And um, when I started this research for the, show, for the show, I started talking to the National Park Service. And I knew that the National Park Service owned some of these modern buildings. It turns out they owned seven uh, what are considered A-list modern houses. And um, they really had no idea that they were of any architectural or historic um, value. So um, basically, when the, when the park, when the, when the Cape Cod National Seashore was created, uh, basically the Kennedys proposed to create the seashore in um, 59. And then people thought about that for two years because there was a lot of plans to develop um, the outer Cape. And if you've ever been on Ocean View Drive in Wellfleet, that was all gridded up and going to be developed with hotels and stuff. So. Um, the Kennedys and the Saltonstalls, to some degree, um, kind of recognized that the Cape was on the verge of being overdeveloped and proposed this um, large you know, national park. This was the first time that they ever tried to create a national park where there were already a lot of people living. So there was a complicated process, political and uh, you know, persuasion process, to, um, to get this to... Um, pass. It passed in 61, and uh, the park had a certain allotment of money to go out and buy land. Um, so a lot of that 800 acres was um, sold to the park that Jack Phillips owned. And if you had, if there was a, if you had built, started building your house between 59 and 61, you were gambling that that legislation would not pass. And this house fell into that category. So it was started in 1960, and they were gambling that, that the legislation wouldn't pass. When it did, the park generally gave those people 25 years, um, a 25-year lease, and then they had to vacate, and the park was supposed to demolish those buildings that were built in that two-year period. After 61, there was a total moratorium on new building within the park. So. Um, the Hatch Cottage was derelict. Uh, Ruth Hatch uh, lived there till she was 93 on a, uh, with, under special permission on a year-to-year -year lease. And then uh, when she died, it reverted to the park, and we immediately applied for a lease, um, which we did receive. But this is pretty much what the house looked like when we got it. Um, it was uh, in rough shape. Buildings on the Outer Cape weather very quickly. But it had this beautiful um, Douglas fir um, uh, siding on the inside. So we started reconstruction, um, and uh, which required digging up all the footings. 
and replacing them because they had all cracked. This is our crew, which is Andre, Vasilios, and Jelly. And um, they, they're, you see the holes there where they're digging up all the footings. And this is the fox that came every day to watch the work. <laughs> So this is in, in the park, so this is a very wild, um, wild and untrammeled spot. We also had to rebuild the deck, which was um, this the sort of um, construction of, of fur one by fours that were set on the, on the short end with these blocks. Um, this is actually a very clever design, too, because the water just passes right through. Um, when we rebuilt it, we actually um, made these as pallets, as prefabricated pallets with threaded rods through the blocking that made them stronger. They were kind of, um, originally they had no blocking and they were very bouncy and then they kind of, the, the family basically were um, New York intellectuals and not carpenters and they did these very strange adaptations to the house over time to try to ameliorate the, the um, you know, functional problems. So we had to kind of decide during the restoration which, one of, which ones of those to keep and which ones not to. So um, this is the new, the new deck. And you'll notice that this is also a George Nelson reference, George Nelson's benches that you see, um, designed within reach and whatever, but they're, they're these maple benches that are basically very much like these. It's like a giant, George Nelson bench. Um, there are the shutters open, and this is one of the other rooms. Um, in this house, we were very fortunate in that we were already talking to the Hatch family um, when, by, before Ruth passed away, so they took all of the contents and put them in storage. So with this restoration, we got all of the furniture, art, books, um, kitchen equipment, everything back in the house exactly the way it was, which really adds a lot to the experience. So these, um, so we have restored three of these buildings and we rent them in the summer, basically to pay the bills for the whole project. Um, and then in the spring and fall, we do an artist and scholar residence in, um, usually June and September, sometimes into October, um, with, uh, so that's um, basically during the, during the temperate months. Another, the third one of these Brahmin Bohemians um, was Hayden Walling, um, who a number of the women in their 80s that I interview said he was the handsomest man they'd ever met in their life. <laughs> anyway, um, between the three of those guys, I think they were married 14 times. <laughs> um, but Hayden Walling's very interesting family. Um, his parents were important American socialists. Um, there's a book about them called Revolutionary Lives. But they actually um, were good friends with John Reed, who they, they all hung out in Provincetown. Um, and uh, his parents met in Russia during the Bolshevik Revolution, where they were both pretending to be journalists, but actually hiding dynamite and um, helping the revolutionaries. And um, they were imprisoned by the Tsar and um, got out because they were American citizens, although his mother, Anna Strunsky, was uh, born in Russia. Anyway, very fascinating group of people, um, and he started coming to Provincetown as a kid with his parents. He met Jack Phillips and bought a piece of land uh, right on Slough Pond. So when he was still 18, he started building this, this house. Um, and this is another example of that kind of hybridization. You have um, all of these pieces of old buildings like this tower which was an old water tower in Wellfleet Center that um, they were demolishing. So he got a um, wagon and dragged it back into the woods and set it up as part of the house. Um, this is the interior. So there's this kind of mixing of modern and vernacular architecture. 
This is another house he did, um, the Lachey house for the painter James Lachey. Um, he was also completely untrained um, and also kind of taught himself construction. He became a very good builder, and uh, but he wouldn't really do he wouldn't really draw things. He would sort of arrive and start building, and um, he used a lot of salvaged material like the wood wood you see on the wall around the fireplace. And uh, this is a studio, uh, James Lachey studio. So these buildings were very inexpensive. Um, often, in this case, the, the siding is plywood. Um, <clears throat> the glass, um, this is also just built with available materials. So the, the biggest piece of plate glass he could get was that, the width of those windows. And he couldn't get one that, that tall, so he would lap it. So actually, there's two pieces of glass there that are lapped almost like clabbards. Um, so there's this sort of uh, do-it-yourself curtain wall, glass curtain wall, um, uh, north facing. And a lot of these early buildings were, were studios for, for painters. This is the Halpern House um, by Hayden Walling, and here he's created a whole wall uh, in the same way with, um, with sheets of single pane glass. Uh, let's see, so at the same time uh, in the late 30s, um, there was something else, a momentous occurrence happened, which was, um, the, a, a big group of people from the Bauhaus in Germany came to, the, to Boston and spent the summer of 1937 on Planting Island, which is a little peninsula off of Marion um, in Buzzards Bay, and then formed this uh, strong connection with the Cape, and when they got settled and made a little bit of money, came back, this group came back out to the Cape and bought land and started building houses. So this is the um, Bauhaus in Dessau um, by Gropius. Um, you see this is a glass curtain wall, which was very revolutionary for the time, you know, precast concrete and um, steel sash, plate glass. And the idea of the Bauhaus was really, um, Gropius's concept was to combine the traditions of German handcraft with uh, mass production and new technology of the Industrial Revolution. And this is an interesting kind of um, hybridization as well that's sort of in the DNA of modernism as it, and in some ways has, was, has been um, a contradictory combination is this sort of medieval handcraft idea and the use of, of mass production. The Bauhaus was quite amazingly successful in that they, they um, filed hundreds and hundreds of patents for um, new manufacturing techniques, new fabric uh, com combining natural and synthetic um, um, fibers and uh, just a hugely productive um, short period that the Bauhaus was in operation. Um, this is Marcel Breuer who came to the Bauhaus and when he was 18 from a provincial city in Hungary. Um, Breuer, uh, at, still at a very young age, uh, developed this idea of tubular furniture, tubular chrome, which is an idea he got from uh, bicycle handlebars. Uh, this is the Vasily chair he designed for Vasily Kandinsky, his friend who taught at the Bauhaus. And you can see um, Breuer had this idea, um, which has been called constructivist, which is that um, the different parts, the, 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 the functions of the different functions are, are clearly expressed. So the structural part is, is steel. It's um, doing what steel does. It's, it's malleable. And it's, um, it can be very thin. And, hold, and support the weight of a person. The part that the human body comes in contact with is always a natural material. So that's woven or leather or wicker or some um, idea so that you're never touching the steel. And there's always this, with Breuer's work, there's this, always this clear separation. Um, 
of, of, of materials and what the function, what their function they're performing. Also, there's this extreme revealing of all of the parts. So there's no, there's never upholstery or anything that's hiding the connections, which is the constructivist part. You can see exactly how it's constructed. You can see every every little bolt and nut. Um, this is his Cheska chair. Um, he was 19. Uh, it was he was 22, I believe, when he designed this. In this case, it's a leather uh, leather seat and back. By the way, this is I think one of the most reproduced chairs in history. If you go to a gas station in Bangladesh, you know somebody's sitting on one of these chairs. It's just such a simple and uh, economical idea. So. Um, Gropius there on the right um, had a kind of inner circle at the Bauhaus, which included Zanti Shavinsky in the middle and Herbert Beyer, the graphic designer, on the left, and then um, Breuer and Maholi Naj, who was the um, Hungarian uh, photographer and sculptor who was the, taught the fundamentals class at the Bauhaus. So in 37, um, this whole group had moved to London after the, the last version of the Bauhaus was closed by the Nazis in Berlin. It was uh, mostly an architecture school run by Mies van der Rohe. And uh, they were, got kicked out of various cities and ended up in Berlin. And the, and the Nazis closed the last version of the Bauhaus in 1933. And um, by that time, most of this gang had gone to London um, and were uh, awaiting development. In 37, Gropius got a letter from Harvard asking him to come and uh, teach in the architecture department and really reconfigure the architecture department at Harvard to be a version of the Bauhaus curriculum. The, um, up until then, it had been a Beaux-Arts-oriented um, architecture school, traditional architecture school. So Gropius and this whole group came um, in the summer of 37 and uh, spent that summer on Planting Island. This is um, this included uh, Jose Luis Cert and um, um, Aldous Huxley's brother, who was part of this group, Sig Siegfried Gideon, the historian, and this guy, um, who appears in all of these photos, and Ati Gropius, um, who just passed away a few years ago, who lived in Wellfleet, who is a huge source for the book. So, and I got this photo from her, and I said, who is this guy who's always in, um, in these pictures? And she said, oh, that's Pepe Weisberg. And I'm like, well, who was he? And she said, I don't know, he was just always there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, when in the, in the early 40s, um, so I have to say this group basically dispersed uh, and went all over the country. Gropius and Breuer went to Harvard, and they were basically the teachers for that great generation of American modernists. Um, I am Pei, and I think part of this museum is by him, um, Philip Johnson and Elliot Noyes and, and um, Paul Rudolph. That whole group of people were basically the students of Breuer and Gropius. Um, Zanti Shavinsky went to Black Mountain College, um, where uh, Joseph Albers was already there. There was a terrific show at the ICA about Black Mountain College, uh, which I think is traveling now, but um, this was another hotbed of Bauhaus uh, pedagogy at that time. Maholi Naj went to Chicago uh, to start the new Bauhaus, which became the Institute of Design and then IIT later. And um, Herbert Beyer went to MoMA and did the first, curated the first big um, Bauhaus show at MoMA. Um, so in the early 40s, um, in Wellfleet, some of these European refugees start to, to filter out um, and look for land. Um, and the first one of these was Serge Tremayev, who uh, was from Chechnya and by way of London, uh, educated in London. And uh, his wife Barbara there, who is British, and his sons Ivan and Peter. Ivan is a very f is still practicing a very famous graphic designer, and Peter is an architect who started Cambridge Seven and 
the New England Aquarium and um, also still practicing. So they came to Wellfleet and bought an old hunting cabin from Jack Phillips and this is right on Slough Pond and uh, 11 acres for I think $1,500. Um, there was a outhouse and a water pump in the yard. So these were, um, these guys often would occupy these old hunting, hunting cabins um, that, were, that were there from, from uh, turn of the century. Um, so this is Chermayef's, the main house, and the part closest is um, the original hunting cabin is here. And then every year he would kind of extend it um, and uh, got bigger and bigger. At the end, there's a great big room where, where they would have uh, parties. And, um, and then he started building some other outbuildings. By the way, the, the lifestyle here was um, when, when, when all of these academics started moving to Wellfleet is they were all would generally work during the day doing whatever they did or painting or, or um, or drawing and uh, managing their projects or writing books. And then around four o'clock, they'd all um, get together for cocktails and play ping pong and have long arguments about um, politics and art history. <laughs> um, uh started thinking about this sort of lightweight prototype building um, and these are some early sketches uh, of, of his, of that. The first one he built was a studio for himself and um, there's this sort of X brace in the center or sort of a bow tie truss which um, gave the building some uh, lateral stability and then there are these sort of panels that are hung on the building. And these were originally made of homosote which is pressed paper. Um, so these really were kind of paper buildings, like, like a card, house of cards. Um, he was a painter and very serious about painting, and um, he kind of thought of these buildings as outdoor paintings, and he actually had spaces um, where he would hang paintings outdoors. So there's this real blurring of, uh, <laughs> of a number of boundaries there. Uh, this is that building today. And he would build, he built about seven of these houses. Um, if you wanted more room, he would just make it longer. These are an eight foot uh, modular and an eight foot bay system. And in some cases, I actually just um, did a restoration of one of these. And um, in some cases, they would move the window panels around. Um, so in, in, in the one that I did, they took one of the window panels out and moved it over and moved the solid panel over. So uh, flexible, uh, lightweight uh, buildings. Uh, he also did a couple of these as commercial structures. This is the original printery for the Cape Codder newspaper. So Chermayev um, was settled in there by 40, 1944, and by 1945 already he had made his house into this kind of think tank, um, this, uh, where he would have his friends come and they would uh, sort of hatch these various projects. Um, this is <clears throat> Bernard Rodovsky, um, that's Chermayev, and this is Jury Kepish, who started the Center for Advanced Visual Studies at MIT, a painter, a photographer, and um, a great thinker about kind of um, how to combine arts, the arts and the sciences. Um, and he basically, the Center for Advanced Visual Studies had a number of iterations. It sort of became the media lab now at MIT. Um, so there's this sort of uh, idea of science and creativity. Um, Bernard Rodovsky was an architect, um, Austrian architect, who did a whole series of, ex of uh, shows at, at the Museum of Modern Art. The most famous was Architecture Without Architects. Uh, it became a book that was very, very successful. 
And his interest, main interest, was vernacular architecture around the world and how untrained people had solved all of these architectural problems um, using vernacular uh, methods. So this was, um, and then Tremayev wrote a series of books, Community and Privacy, um, and um, <clears throat> which was very influential. You could say that this was kind of the hippie wing of modernism. They were very interested in um, the end user. They were very interested in um, vernacular architecture and nature and how to make streets and cities and housing work for people. They were very not into formalism. So there, there was a sort of a split from the beginning. And in a way, you could say that that was baked into the cake of this this interest in the vernacular and the handmade and this interest in technology. And in some ways, um, these guys were all the way on one side. So Marcel Breuer uh, came to visit Chermayev in um, around uh, in the mid 40s and bought a piece of land. And he, um, if you know Wellfleet, this is Slough Pond. Um, this is Herring Pond, and this is Williams and Higgins Pond. So this is a sort of piece of land between the ponds. And he envisioned this sort of co uh, colony of houses. Um, in the end, only his house was built, uh, but he was always trying to convince his friends to, uh, to get, become part of this. It, a, a colony did form, but it was more uh, dispersed. His original idea for a house was this elevated long house made of, of wood up on piers with a uh, suspended porch. Um, he ended up enclosing the porch because of mosquitoes and rain, and, uh, but this is the original uh, Breuer prototype house. There are four, four versions of this house in Wellfleet, and the plan is um, basically the, the original prototype is this long, long plan with a single loaded um, corridor and a suspended porch. This was added later on um, on his house and the Wise house also has this, this added wing. So it was sort of an, and then there was a third part to extend the studio. So there's sort of the A, B, C. You start with the A and then you get the B and maybe the C if you need the room. This is the Wise House in Wellfleet. Um, having restored a number of these houses, I have to say that this scheme of getting the building up off the ground makes an enormous amount of sense on the Cape because it's so damp and um, basements get so moldy that having the wind, air be able to pass uh, under and around the building uh, keeps all the wood dry, keeps it from rotting, makes a lot of sense. This is Breuer in 1950 um, in front of his house. And this is the view from his suspended porch, which is this cantilevered um, uh, porch hanging over this great uh, drop and with the view of three different ponds. And this is his son, um, Tom, in front of their house after a storm where they were cutting up trees. This is the Breuer house today. And you can see um, the way the porch is suspended, there's this kind of, um, also this kind of clear explanation of, of structure. You know, the lower piece is in compression and the top piece is in tension and they're working together to, uh, to brace the, the porch. This is Zanti Shavinsky that you saw in that early slide with, with Gropius. Um, he was a great storyteller. This is on the, on the um, porch at Breuer's house. He, called him, he referred to himself as the Jewish Picasso. That was his. <laughs> um, and that's Connie Breuer on the right. And then this woman on the left, um, in the first copy, first printing of the book, we couldn't identify her. And I later discovered that it was Christine Bevington. She still lives in New York. She was, um, her, she was British and Senegalese and came to, uh, was a registered architect and worked in Breuer's office. 
I think she was very rare at that time for women to be registered architects, and I think she might have been one of the only women of color to be, to, to, um, be a registered architect at, at that time. She um, lives in a loft in New York and remembers it all perfectly. Um, Jury Kepish, um, that was in that photo from 45, and his wife, Juliette, um, were very interested in, uh, well, she, she was a great author of children's books. We actually have a show up right now in Wellfleet at the Historic Society of all the children's books produced by this group of modernists. And there's over 200 children's books. And we have a whole room of her original artwork, which is just amazing. Um, she won the Caldecott Award for one of her books. And so this is a room they made for their daughter um, with a mural. And we have a, a reproduction of this mural in the show and these um, trees that the kids could climb on and all of these sort of learning techniques. This is one of her illustrations. Oh, that's the, uh, that's the exhibit. Uh, this is the interior of the Kepish house, with, um, which is one of the other Breuer houses. Um, the, the Kepish house is very original. The other thing about these houses is that you would get the basic chassis and you would add on to it if you wanted to. These were, uh, the original buildings cost about $5,000 to build. Um, it, but this is a plywood floor and uh, unfinished uh, walls. They added homosote to the walls, but the floors are still just mats and uh, rugs on the plywood. And that's the Wise House. This is the Stillman House um, by Breuer and Wellfleet. Uh, we also found a Breuer house in um, Dennis, which was a real surprise because it, nobody knew where it was, and it, was, uh, it had been sort of lost to history. And the um, Museum of Modern Art uh, curator for architecture had asked me if I could find it, and I tried for years, and nobody in Dennis knew anything about it. But then Life uh, magazine dumped their archive online, and I saw this photo, and I could tell that it was the this, this Scott house because um, it was the only Breuer house that was two parallel lines like this. Um, <clears throat> I, I had seen a plan of it, but um, so, I, so I renewed interest. I got this journalist in, interested from the Cape Cod Times, and she did a, a record uh, deed search, and we found the house, and it's completely mints with the original furniture. This was a high-budget Breuer house, um, and it's really amazing. There's one of those Nelson benches. So this was the... Um, higher, fancier version of Breuer's house where you get the plywood, birch plywood on the walls and um, uh, more finished surfaces. Um, part of this, the, the back half of this house was based on Breuer's um, prototype house that was in the MoMA garden. And that house has been moved to um, Terrytown, New York and put on the Rockefeller estate, and this is the interior of that, um, the MoMA prototype house. So by the mid-40s, Gropius and this gang were hanging around in Wellfleet. That's Santi Shavinsky on the right again, and his, um, his assistant there in the middle, they were making kites, and Gropius on the left. Another um, part of this contingent was Paul Weidlinger, who is a Hungarian, uh, engineer, very, very important engineer. He was the structural engineer for Breuer Gropius and uh, worked with uh, Le Corbusier. Came to Wellfleet in 53 and built this house for himself. This is one of the A-list modern houses that the park owned that was derelict. Um, this is the most recent house that we restored. Um, it was empty for 16 years and a large tree crushed um, that right-hand corner. So this was a challenge. Um, it was not in good shape. Uh, this is what it looks like now. We completely restored it. It's really a wonderful, wonderful building. Um, and uh, so for this one, we had to find the furniture and the artwork 
um, uh, since it was a totally uh, just an empty shell. Uh, another interesting house um, in wealth in Truro is um, the Mark House by Paul Kruger. Paul Kruger is the only architect that we cover um, in the book who's actually still practicing. Um, so this is a house um, in Truro for a uh, minister, um, Ed Mark, and Paul Kruger, um, this, is, this is a three-story building that's only 12 feet wide. And um, I love this kitchen. It's just two burners, a sink, an under counter fridge, and a KLH Model 21 radio. <laughs> And they said that they've had dinner parties for 12 here with this. And I also love this house is completely unchanged. They haven't really, they haven't changed it once. And it was um, $8,000 construction cost in 1964. So Kruger was working for, um, for CERT in CERT's office when uh, Cor Le Corbusier did the Carpenter Center at Harvard, which is the only building that he did in North America. And um, he chose, uh, Corbu chose Kruger to be the architect of, uh, in charge, even though he was only 23 or 24 at the time. So he worked directly with the master and um, was very influenced by the uh, Unité de Habitation, the, the Corbusier building in, in Marseille. Um, and actually, the um, this is this is the great one here um, explaining the, the unité, and the, this is one of the apartments in the unité, which are about 12 feet wide, and he envisioned this house as being one slice of the unité of one of these apartments, which are two story on one end and one story on the other, um, as a sort of freestanding slice of this building. And these are the marks here. Um, another uh, couple of people who are in Wellfleet, Olaf Hammerstrom, who is Finnish, uh, worked for Alvar Alto and worked very closely with Eero Saarinen, taught at Cranbrook in uh, Michigan. And he and his wife, Marianne Strengel, who was a very renowned uh, textile designer, um, built this little house in Wellfleet, and you can see the plan there's, which is, I always think is very clever, and wonder why more people don't do this. This is a, this is the, a little insulated, um, winterized part of the house, and then this sort of pass-through with the big summer living room. I mean, this is a tiny house, but um, this is the, there's the, the pass-through, there's sort of big sort of barn doors. So there's a summer part of the building and a winter part of the building. Uh, Nathaniel Saltonstall, who was a nephew of, of Leverett Saltonstall, um, did the colony, which is a little cottage colony. He also did a number of houses and uh, an art gallery in Wellfleet. This is the uh, beginning, this is the, um, the old gallery building at the colony. And Charlie Zender, who um, was a Korean War veteran, came to Wellfleet in 57 and bought land and started building. He's the most prolific um, of the architects, modern architects. He's built over 53 houses in Wellfleet and Truro, um, including three poured concrete towers, which are really amazing structures. Um, this is the Brodeur house. Um, at the time, uh, these were very in, also very inexpensive houses, and at the time, poured concrete was very, a very cheap way to build. And he hooked up with a company in Boston that did parking garages, and got them to come down and do these a series of these buildings. Um, when I when I interviewed his son, his his son said he was very, he loved Frank Lloyd Wright, and he loved these fortifications in Normandy. And I, I didn't ever understand that until I saw these pictures, which are amazing. They're fantastic buildings. Um, I guess he'd seen these uh, and were, was very impressed. Um, this is the Kugel Gibbs House which, by Charlie Zender, which was the first house we restored. Um, 
and uh, built in, this is built in 1970, and uh, quite an amazing, you see the Frank Lloyd Wright influence here. And a much more complicated plan. He, Zender, ironically, also never went to architecture school. He went to RISD um, in um, industrial design. And, um, but he was also doing his own thing, um, really uh, idiosyncratic and interesting. You can see this is not a simple box. It's very maze-like plan. And this is what it looked like when we got it. It was uh, a lot of raccoons and bats and um, animals living in there. And this is the, during the reconstruction. Another ironic thing is that Breuer actually never studied, went to architecture school because he got all the way through the Bauhaus before they had an architecture curriculum. So there's almost nobody in this whole story that actually went to architecture school. <laughs> um, some other people who were, uh, who were hanging around, uh, Conrad Voxman, who is the father of the space frame. Um, this is one of his drawings. Um, and he and Gropius came up with this um, prefabricated um, house system called the general panel house, uh, which is one of those many prefab house companies that, that never took off, that went bankrupt <laughs> after a couple of years. Um, Aero Saarinen and the whole Saarinen family um, came to this same dirt road where Breuer and, and Tremayev lived, um, and along with them Florence Knoll. Florence Knoll kind of was orphaned and grew up with the Saarinens at Cranbrook, um, Cranbrook in uh, Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. And she, of course, she was an a, a amazing furniture designer, but she also um, knew all of the great architects, furniture designing architects at the time, and agreed, got them to agree to license their furniture and really started, um, uh, you know, made Knoll Furniture what it became as the, as the retailer of all those great designs. Um, Alvar Alto also came out in mid-40s when he was teaching at MIT and did this drawing, uh, Cape Cod Hurricane. Uh, so anyway, we do the, um, you know, we rent the houses in the summer. Uh, we do a lot of house tours and we do the artist and scholar residency. And uh, if you're interested in any of those things, you can check out our website. Thanks very much. So now we have time for some questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you. Thank you, that, that was wonderful. Sure. The, um, <clears throat> you alluded to a, a, a few things. One is the lack of requirement for building permits. So if you, you, there's no way you could build any of this stuff today or uh, let me rephrase that, a lot of this stuff today. You need a full basement, you need full insulation. The idea of the, the small insulated space um, and having this extended uh, summer space. Yeah. You simply can't do that because the requirements are the whole thing has to be insulated, has to be weatherproofed in a certain way. And uh, so a lot of the, the other thing is the cost of land really precludes, pardon, precludes this kind of wonderful experimentation that, that you used to, do, that used to be able to do. Ironically, the availability of engineered materials, uh, connect, uh, connecting architectural, uh, that is, the ability to connect different mem members simply by bolting things together has, has made those kinds of things actually much easier than they used to be. And, and so you, you is, is, I guess my question is, is there another place besides the Cape where you can do that sort of stuff anymore, where we find this kind of architecture? I think it's Pittsburgh. <laughs> uh, no, everybody, you know, Detroit. I, was, I went to Detroit to um, 
to do research for the book to go to Cranbrook, and there's and all the architecture students are buying, they can buy a lot for one hundred and fifty dollars, and they do their senior project on the empty lot, you know. So there's uh, that this moment, historic moment on the Cape is definitely past. We have a terrible af affordable housing crisis going on because of the cost of land, and um, yes, in, in many for for many reasons you can't build this way anymore. Uh, one of the main ones is the wind requirement. We now have the same wind, we're in the same wind zone as Dade County, Florida. So the amount of bolting together you have to do of buildings is crazy. And, and the wonderful thing about these buildings is their lightness and they're, they're so delicate. Um, and that's very, very hard to reproduce today. There are ways to get around the, um, the winter summer thing. There's creative ways that people do that. Um, which are not quite legal, but um, <laughs> actually, in in Wellfleet and Truro, you can build um, you can build as many sheds as you want that are of a certain size. And so, I'm always trying to convince people to build sheds that are summer bedrooms. You know, you can't have plumbing, but you can have electricity, and that way, you can have a main building that's all heated. And when you really need the space, you know, you have these uninsulated. Uh, sort of satellites. That's the that's the easiest way to do it. But there's also a lot of people who build a great big garage, you know, that's that's a multi-use space, and you know, there's ways you can get around it. You know. But the but the land uh, the cost of land and the availability of land, and ironically, the creation of the national park has is tied up so much land. That it's 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 you know fed the the cost you know the increase. Also, Wellfleet and all these towns are doing this land bank thing where it, when when land comes up, they buy it and they put it in conservation, which which is nice, but it's ironically exacerbating the housing project. You know, so it's a very small piece of you know land, and uh, yeah, you can't be an adjunct professor and go and build a crazy house there anymore, yeah. <laughs> oh. was, was there any of this type of architecture on the vineyard or Nantucket? Good segue. I'm doing a, unfortunately it's sold out, but I'm doing a modern house tour on the vineyard in Chilmark uh, later this month. So there's, a, there's, a, there's some really terrific modern houses on the vineyard, and they're almost all in Chilmark around Menemsha Pond. Um, there was a group of Guys from well, Elliot Noyes moved there first. Um, there's four Elliot Noyes houses, and then there's this group of uh, professors from Cooper Union that moved um, there and built these amazing houses. There's some really terrific modern houses, but they're mostly from the '60s. Okay. Yes. I was curious about the roofs on these kind of buildings and how they hold up to New England winters. Well, the old original roofs um, were tar and gravel and various things which, which had a certain shelf life. Now they have rubber roofs and they're really no problem. I mean, you can have a dead flat roof, rubber roof, in, unless a raccoon digs through it. You know, they're basically impervious. I mean, it has to hold up to the snow load, but we don't get that much snow on the Cape. Mm -hmm. Oh, I guess you Next can question over here. Could you say a little bit about Hayden Walling? Hayden Walling? Well, you have to read my book. Yeah. <laughs> what do you want to know? He was an interesting character. Yes. I mean, he really a uh, fascinating guy. Um, and we, we get into him somewhat in the book. But he, you know, he was a conscientious objector. These guys were all you know, leftists and um, didn't believe in war. And uh, so he, he sat out the war in Wellfleet. Um, actually, they were raising turkeys um, as a, to become sort of essential agriculture producers. And, um, and then right after the war, he went to Europe and he did this very dangerous work demining Italian hill towns um, and um, married this amazing woman, Odette, um, Walling, very beautiful woman who had been a spy, uh, had been a, worked for the resistance, and actually was put in a concentration camp and 
um, survived, and did, then they, they, it's a really amazing story. It would make a great movie, um, but <laughs> uh, yeah, fascinating people. No. Nope. No, all self-taught. That was part of the kind of do-it-yourself um, part of it, which I think is also really You didn't need a license or to be registered or anything in those no. days? No. There, you know, it's, it, doing the research for this, is one of the challenges is that they didn't really issue building permits until the early 70s. So none of these houses, most of them, there's no paperwork on them. So you can't find, you know, you find an interesting building and you can't, you know, you can't figure out when it was built, who designed it, nothing. Unless you can find the people who knew, you know, family members and stuff. So a lot of the research for the book was oral histories, just trying to find everybody who's still alive who was around at that time uh, and, you know, talking to them, yeah. I'm curious as to what sort of intellectual revolution went on at places like Harvard to bring the Bauhaus in and really do this, seems like a 180 degree shift. <clears throat> um, there's a whole book about that. Um, Hudnut, who is the, the president or the dean at Harvard, um, there's a whole book about the correspondence between him and Gropius about um, this process of, of, of bringing Gropius there to teach the Bauhaus uh, curriculum. Um, I'm not an expert in that, but, but somebody did a PhD on it, and we had them as a lecturer. Um, but, you know, at that time, the late 30s, uh, modernism was, um, you know, it was in ascendance, and, 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 you know, people had to adapt. I mean, post-war, in the post-war, it really boomed because you really, but you were, but even before, before and during the war, you were getting all these European emigres who um, were starting to go to, you know, U.S. universities and, um, but the 30s was kind of the transition. If you look at architecture magazines from the 30s, it's interesting because you have sort of Art Deco and this sort of colonial and some modernism, and then by the 40s, you've really got modernism has really, you know, taken over. Um, the, the houses that were in the cube design, you know, where you could add on, was there some um, idea that those would become kits of some sort? Like a yeah. Sears robot? Yeah. yeah. So it's funny, there's this sort of dream, you know, the, the dream of the prefab house, which um, is there from the beginning of modernism, this inexpensive, flexible, prefabricated modular buildings. And everybody tried it. Breuer had his version. Um, Saltonstall, um, Nathaniel Saltonstall, who did the colony, he had this whole... Um, sort of community he had planned out in Stoughton or somewhere of, of passive solar houses, and this is in the 40s. There was a big passive solar um, craze in the 40s because of the high price of, of fuel, which completely vanished when air conditioning and, 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 and uh, you know. Um, but um, they all had their scheme for prefabricated, inexpensive modular buildings. And most of them never took off. Some of them did, like Carl Koch, who was also a student of uh, Gropius, started um, Tech Built. And actually, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of those built out in um, Concord and actually all over the country. So that, was, that one really did take off. Um, and Sears and Roebuck did have prefabricated houses. There's a whole interesting history of prefab buildings. And a lot of them are from Massachusetts. For some reason, a lot of the prefab companies, and, and um, there was the Lustron House, which are you know enameled steel. There's a great book uh, by Fiden called Prefab Ho Prefab Houses um, that has the whole history of it, which is really interesting. But Hatch um, Jack Hall did did conceive of that the Hatch House as a, as a, as a prefab house that you could sell and arrange in different ways. It's just that, and I actually have his correspondence where he tried to sell it 
and he just never got anybody to agree to it. It's a pretty, it's a pretty avant-garde house. I mean, you, you have to actually go outdoors to get to the bathroom and the bedrooms, you know. And uh, so it's it's uh, not for everybody. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you, Peter. Thank you.